Hello, and welcome to episode two of Expert Brain. For those of you who are just joining us, this is a podcast episode YouTube video thing where I try to unlock the contents of the brain of one of my expert friends. Today's guest, as you'll see in a second, is Brian Cutter of TikTok fame. Brian is an expert in the philosophy of mind, so things quickly get very abstract, theoretical, metaphysical, etc. But I hope you enjoy the episode, and if you'd like to see us cover any topics, please just throw them in the comments, and I will try to find an expert friend with an expert brain who can talk about it. Enjoy! All right, so I want to welcome Brian Cutter, who is not only a philosophy professor here at the University of Notre Dame, where I also teach, but also uh, a neighbor of mine, and you may know, a TikTok star. Brian's been making some TikToks uh, with me over the past couple of weeks, and so if you're coming from TikTok, you're going to recognize him from that. Brian is an incredibly smart guy, and he's a uh, professional philosopher focusing on uh, philosophy of mind. This is kind of his area of expertise. So we're going to talk about the philosophy of mind. I don't know much at all about the philosophy of mind. So I'm hoping to learn a lot from Brian on this topic. And Brian, if it's OK, I'm just going to pitch the first question right to you. Uh, it goes like this. Look, sometimes it seems like we should be embarrassed to think that there is a mind that is somehow separable from or that goes above and beyond just like our brain in our head, right? It's like this mind, it's like this spooky thing. Maybe it's immaterial or I don't know, uh, intangible in some way. And so my, my, my first question for you is just, should we be embarrassed by that? If we hold this view that the mind is not the brain, should we be embarrassed by that? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And uh, thanks, first of all, for, for having me on. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I guess I, I think one should not be embarrassed to hold the view that the mind is in some sense something over and above the, the physical processes going on in your brain. Um, I think that's a, a philosophically respectable view and, and a view that, that I find to be quite plausible and that many other philosophers do as, as, as well. Um, so as I see it, there's a number of distinct separable kind of aspects or faculties or components of our mental lives that it seems very hard to explain in kind of in purely physical terms, in terms of information processing going on in your brain or in terms of kind of biochemical, electrochemical processes in your brain. And the difficulties seem to me and to many other philosophers to be kind of not merely a matter of, you know, the, the fact that currently we don't know all the details of brain functioning, but the difficulties seem to be a kind of more in principle sort of difficulty. That, that, that physical explanations in principle aren't up to the task of explaining all, all the different aspects that we, 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 we find to exist in our minds. So let me just go into a few of those difficulties. Yeah, um, can, I, can I ask you one thing, Brian, before you do that, and I'll make a note here. So the difficulties in explaining uh, the mind in terms of physical elements uh, is where we're going to come back to. My, my sort of even you know prior question to that is just, you know, is the materialist say, although I'm using that term in a way, correct me if I'm not using it totally properly, is the materialist view the default? Because I, I guess that's part of the embarrassment for me. It, it seems like when we're talking about our mental lives, and I like that you're framing this in terms of our mental lives, it seems like the default should be well, it's just, you know, material stuff, the kind of neurons and the chemicals and the biological tissue that you were talking about. Do you, mm -hmm. is, is that what philosophers of mind typically think? Okay, materialism is the default. Now let's give an explanation as to, you know, why we should maybe add something to the default or not. Or is that not how philosophers of mind kind of approach the question? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I think the answer will differ at, at, at different periods of, of the history of thinking in, in philosophy of mind. So for the vast majority of the history of philosophy, philosophers have not been materialists by and large. And in fact, through, throughout most of the history of philosophy, people thought materialism was, was actually pretty crazy and pretty, pretty hard to believe. And that, that's true even through um, much of the first, like the, through the, the first half of the 20th century. Um, it's only 
from around the time of the middle of the 20th century that materialism has gained something akin to this, the status of, of orthodoxy or maybe a default view um, within philosophy of mind. But you know, e even within that period, there have been a number of very notable dissenters and it's, it, you know, materialists tend to agree that there's very powerful or at least prima facie powerful arguments and intuitions that, that seem to push us in in an anti-materialist direction. Okay, cool, cool. So is it fair to say that the difficulties you're now going to raise for this view that maybe the mind is the brain or whatever it might be, is it fair to say that these are difficulties for materialism? Uh, can we use that term? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the difficulties I want to focus on would, would certainly be difficulties for the materialist view that kind of all facts about us and all facts about our minds can be kind of reductively explained in terms of the movements of atoms, physical properties and structures in the brain, patterns of computation and information processing in the brain and that sort of thing. So that, that would be the materialist view. And then the difficulties I wanna focus on would, would be seen as difficulties for, for that kind of picture of reality and, and kind of the, the place of the mind within the broader natural order. Cool. All right. So let's use that as kind of our definitional stuff. What are the difficulties? Why is it so hard to explain the mind in terms of these stuff? Good, good. So I guess the, the first and maybe most famous problem with materialist conceptions of the mind has to do with what philosophers call consciousness or phenomenal consciousness. Um, uh, this is the idea that we have subjective experience. We have a first person point of view on the world. There's, there's something that's like to be us. There's something that's like to, to see red or to taste coffee or to smell a rose. There's a kind of subjective experiential aspect to our mental lives that, that seems on the face of it to kind of go beyond mere physical processes, mere information processing in the brain. So, um, uh, there's there's a famous thought experiment due to the early modern philosopher uh, named Leibniz, where he said, you know, you could imagine kind of um, blowing up the brain, kind of expanding all its parts, but keeping the various proportions intact and so that it was large enough that you could walk into it the way you would walk into a mill. Like a Gross. This is disgusting. And yeah, and you know, it's like you can imagine kind of viewing all the material parts within your brain and seeing their mechanical interactions with one another, seeing how one part pushes against another part. And he claims it's just completely self-evident that no matter how many details of the kind of mechanical functioning of the brain you observe from this perspective, you won't find a perception and you won't find anything that can kind of like explain why we have perceptions in the sense of subjective experiences of colors and sounds and smells and things like that. Um, hmm. Within within contemporary philosophy, this is this basic idea is sometimes put in terms of the the hard problem of consciousness. So the thought mm -hmm. is there's a distinction between the the easy problems of consciousness and the hard problem of consciousness. So this is a distinction made made famous by the philosopher David Chalmers. So the easy problems of consciousness are the is the problem of explaining the kinds of behavior and functioning associated with consciousness. So um, uh, perceptual discrimination and um, be, you know, like verbal reports and um, learning and changes of behavior over time in response to stimuli. So those would belong to the, the easy problems of consciousness. And he thinks, you know, we, we, we've got kind of good promising scientific models for solving the easy problems of consciousness. You can um, ex explain these behavior and functionings in, in terms of um, computational processes in the brain. And even though we don't know all the details, we kind of um, we, we kind of know how to solve those sorts of problems and they seem to be scientifically tractable. The hard problem of consciousness is why all these physical processes in the brain are associated with any subjective experience at all. It seems like any purely any purely physical description mm. of what goes on in your brain is compatible with the absence of subjective experience. It's compatible with the absence of, say, a vivid subjective experience of red or a subjective smell sensation of a rose. So, so, mm. so that would be the, 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 the hard problem of consciousness. And I think it's fair to say that the, the existence and character of consciousness in the sense of subjective first personal experience it has the status of a kind of scientific mystery. We know a lot about correlations between mm. certain kinds of physical activity in the brain and certain types of sub subjective experiences, but we don't even have the beginnings of a kind of reductive explanation of how it is that you get consciousness 
purely in virtue of physical processes going on in the brain. Okay, okay, okay. A lot to unpack here. And I want to just confirm the last thing you said is that, you know, there's a lot we know about the correlations between processes in the brain, physical sort of interactions and perception, subjectivity, consciousness. So if I poke somebody, this is horrible, but if I poke somebody's brain with like an ice pick, it's like, oh, we know they're going to like do this behavior. We also know that like, you know, maybe it's going to flash light or something perception, you know, perceptually. Mm -hmm. You're saying like, okay, none of that though, none of those correlations really explain this, this mysterious connection between the physical stuff and the what it is to experience the subjectivity. So as long as that's right, and stop me if it's not, I want to go back to this disgusting thought experiment, like the brain factory, mm -hmm. Leibniz walking through the brain factory. Okay. The initial you know, sort of reason I had to think that, that this proved something deep here that, and, and that this should make me more um, uh, sort of inclined to accept the, the, the view that you're sketching out and reject the materialist worldview. Mm -hmm. The initial poll that it had, I think is actually wrong for me. So the initial poll was like, yeah, I'm walking through the brain and I don't see anything that resembles a perception, right? I think that's even the way you put it. Then I thought, well, wait a second. Why should I expect the things I can see to resemble the sort of object of perception? And the analogy that I have is like, if I'm walking through a theater and it's not operating at the time, say, uh, and I see a projector, that's the thing that causes the visual whatever. But like, I look at the projector and I'm like, well, there's nothing in here that could possibly give rise to, or could explain, fully explain the visual experience you get when you go to the movie theater, you know, uh, moving pictures must be spooky, magical, immaterial objects. Good. Well, so the, the, the move for me that I think was mistaken was that, you know, initially I thought, well, yeah, if I can see a perception, seeing a perception should be like perceiving the thing itself, et cetera. That doesn't seem like a good move. So is there more to the thought experiment than the kind of bad reasoning I was engaged in or potentially bad reasoning? Good. So I wouldn't want to lean too heavily on Leibniz's presentation of the thought experiment. I think it's a nice sure. way to kind of pump the intuition that there, there seems to be a radical difference in kind between kind of a subjective experience of bright pink on the one hand and kind yep. of physical mechanical processes within the soggy gray matter of the brain on the other. Um, <laughs> so poetic, but, Brian. You just have this poetic way of, you know, describing the soggy gray. But anyway, sorry. All right. Continue. I think I stole that line from Colin McGinn. So I don't oh, want to think okay. of, All right. All um, right. But, and, and I think there's a little bit of sloppiness in the way that Leibniz talks about it. So the phrase okay. he uses is, we would find nothing in the mechanical processes in the brain that could explain a perception. And the mm. word explain here is a little bit tricky because if all we mean by explain is like causally generate or somehow produce or give rise to, then yeah. sure, I think everyone should agree that physical activity in the brain causally produces, it generates, it gives rise to subjective experience. Because, I mean, we just know scientifically that if you poke and prod on certain areas of the brain in the right way, that is just going to lead to us having certain subjective experiences. So everyone should agree that there's at least a causal relationship between physical stuff going on in the brain and the existence of these, these states of consciousness, these subjective experiences. Um, what the what the dualist or the anti-materialist denies is not a causal relation, but a kind of tighter or more constitutive relation. Or, you know, that so what, what they deny is that the subjective experience just is some set of physical processes in the brain. And here I think your analogy with the projector and the image on the screen is exactly right. If I look at the projector and I don't see like say a big picture of like Keanu Reeves, like, you know, or doing whatever, like on the actual physical projector, um, it would be a mistake for me to conclude this thing is incapable of causing an image of Keanu Reeves. Mm -hmm. But if mm -hmm. my conclusion was just the giant image of Keanu Reeves that I saw up on the screen is not itself in, you know, it, it, it is not one and the same as the stuff in the projector, then 
then that itself might be right. Or maybe that's not a great analogy because I guess there are like negative images in the pro in, in, in the projector. Sure. Um, sure, but, sure. you know, maybe a better analogy would be, you know, stuff going on in my computer tower generates images on my monitor. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a causal relationship there. But if you, you know, but but if you thought that like the 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 pink circle that shows up on my computer monitor literally exists as a pink circle in the computer tower, you'd be confused. Of course, there can be a causal relationship there, but it's not like the pink circle that I observe on my monitor is one and the same as yeah. some pattern of electrical activity in my, my computer tower. They're, they're distinct, however closely causally related they may be. This is interesting. So, okay, let's pretend Chalmers is in the room. David Chalmers, who you referenced a second ago, and you said, you know, he's, he's kind of at least popularized. Maybe he's responsible for this distinction between hard and easy problems of consciousness. So first off, Mr. Chalmers, I would say, those easy problems of consciousness do not sound easy to me at all. Uh, you know, I mean, if I was like a neurobiologist working on uh, explaining the perceptual apparatus, et cetera, the things you were describing as easy problems of consciousness, I mean, first of all, I think like, whoa, like that's gonna be complex, but it, Seems like what you, what he means, you know, what what you were meaning by easy is more like, well, look, given the knowledge that we have, the scientific knowledge that we have, and given the even conceptual philosophical understanding that we have, it's it's pretty easy for us to kind of project out and say we're going to figure those things out. We know in principle what an explanation of that sort looks like. We know that we can give those explanations. We just need a lot more data, a lot more time, scientific progress, etc. So what's interesting to me is is then why Chalmers would look at consciousness, subjectivity, what have you, and say like, but that man, and, and what you're saying here helps me, but I wanna sort of clarify, you know, for, for those who may be watching this, again, maybe coming from TikTok, wherever, Chalmers is not, he, he does not have worldview-based reasons for believing in the immateriality, say, of the mind or, you know, and we'll get to this maybe in a little bit, uh, especially the soul, right? If you think the soul is something over and above even the mind, et cetera. Um, so, so here's a guy who is coming to this question, you know, as objectively as possible in the sense that there's no kind of non uh, area specific reasoning that he's engaged in that kind of entails, hey, I've got to believe something about divisions between physical and mental. I mean, is that all roughly right? So yeah, so that's right. Um, his he he describes himself as a reductive materialist at heart, not mm -hmm. in the sense that he at the end of the day accepts this reductive materialist view, but that's that's the view that kind of temperamentally and based on his background worldview he would like to accept. It's just that mm -hmm. he 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 found after a lot of thought that um, that you know consciousness doesn't really fit into the, the the reductive materialist picture of the world but even after you know accepting a, a kind of dualism the idea that consciousness is not reducible to physical processes in the brain he's still broadly speaking what you would call a naturalist so he doesn't believe in any kind of traditional god he doesn't think that the universe has a purpose he doesn't think that human beings have any kind of very special place within within the cosmic scheme um so he his his motivations are not at all kind of like religious motivations yeah. or 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 other kinds of big worldview motivations of the kind that, that might motivate some people to believe in mm -hmm. an immaterial mind or an immaterial soul and that's true i mean you, Contemporary philosophy is a is a pretty secular field, and there, there are a lot of um, philosophers of mind who have totally secular, naturalistic, big picture worldviews, but are just convinced that consciousness can't be reduced to physical processes. So they accept some kind of dualism or some variation on dualism about consciousness, but it's but it's not at all motivated by um, any religious or quasi-religious considerations. That's super interesting. All right. So I want to pivot now. Right before I do, I'm going to say something and then I'm going to pivot. And if you want to return to this thing, that's fine. But yeah. this is the thing I want to say. I want to say it is fascinating to me that somebody like Chalmers or somebody like you with both expert knowledge and a bunch of skills for like researching this kind of stuff, et cetera, could be in a position to see this massive distinction between easy and hard problems of consciousness. Because for me, looking at either of these things, I think I'm in a place of total, not total, but like near total ignorance, right? 
the problems of hard consciousness versus easy consciousness, it strikes me as like, you know, those problems could be as similar as, you know, the, the difference between the explanation as to like why uh, a fan works and why like a jet engine works. Like for me, looking at these things, I just think like, well, gosh, I can kind of see the mechanics of the, and the electricity and the fan, et cetera. But like the jet engine just seems like it's more complex, but kind of similar principles, et cetera. It's fascinating to me that, that somebody with kind of the expertise, the background can look at these and just think like, they are so massively different. And what you do helps explain why this is the case, but it's also just like really interesting to me. It kind of makes me want to like, you know, get just enough of that expertise to like really just be able to sort of perceive like the difference. That's cool. Okay. If you want to, you want to say something, you look like you want to say something. Oh, I, I could talk all day about that. Maybe I'll say just one yeah. thing. So ultimately the, the so-called easy problems of consciousness are basically going to be problems about explaining behavior. Like mm -hmm. how, how is it that we manage to behave in certain ways in response to sensory stimuli? Like how is it that mm -hmm. um, the brain manages to pull off a trick where when a tennis ball is coming at me, somehow mm -hmm. light goes into my eye, there's a whir and whiz of information processing in my brain, and then my hands go up and catch the tennis ball. You know, that, that's, that's an interesting feat. But to the extent that we're only trying to explain outward physical behavior, it's kind of clear what in principle would do that. We just need to find some physical mechanism in the brain that can take us from light impinging on my eyes to ultimately my hands going up. And probably, probably the physical story there is going to be very lengthy and detailed and complex, but that's the sort of thing that science has always been in the business of explaining, kind of mm. complex chains of physical causation where, whereby yeah. one physical cause eventually leads to a certain physical effect. But when it comes to explaining consciousness, like the existence of subjective experience, it's clear that the, the, the explanandum, the thing we're trying to explain is seems to be different in kind from mere physical behavior. So um, it's, it, 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 it seems like we're, we're explaining a fundamentally different kind of thing than why the body behaves in certain ways or why any given physical thing behaves in certain ways. But the thing we're trying to explain seems to have a different nature than in, in, in the case of the hard problem than in the case of the easy problems. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Uh, do you experience awe when you think about like the mysteriousness of subjectivity? Like for me, I look at a jet engine, I think like, that's cool, like I'm impressed. But I look at something I cannot understand. I cannot like fathom the explanander, or whatever you're saying, you know, the, the, the kind of explanation we're looking for and like the mysteriousness of it. Like it inspires this totally different reaction. Like I, 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 I'm like awestruck. Do you ever feel that way? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I certainly feel awestruck, and a sense that we we've reached a kind of explanatory bedrock. Where we've re reached something like a fundamental aspect of reality or a fundamental hmm. ingredient of the universe. And in a way, I think when it in, in the case of consciousness, I think it goes beyond merely the fact that we've reached some kind of fundamental aspect of reality. We've also reached kind of an aspect of reality that kind of gives point or meaning or value to anything else. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, it has always seemed to me that a universe that's just a bunch of configurations of atoms with no subjective experience, no, no awareness or consciousness of anything would be a fundamentally pointless, valueless, meaningless reality. So like mm -hmm. a, a world physically exactly like ours but without accompanying sensory experience, consciousness, um, would be a world, I think, arguably completely devoid of value, but at least devoid of a lot of what makes reality a, a, a valuable and meaningful and, and, and pointful place. I mean, this is perfect, right? Because uh, this, is, this was the pivot. The pivot was okay. from, uh, it's perfect. This is like pivoting from the, questions that you're raising and this question about materialism and about the mind and about consciousness etc to questions about why it should matter and questions of value and what you just said um like let me let me try to frame it and see if if this uh is the way you're thinking about it what you said reminded me of uh for whatever reason rube goldberg machines you know a rube goldberg machine where okay go has this incredible video where they have this rube goldberg machine they make you know 
And you just like, you tap the thing, like a ball at the top, and then it goes down and knocks over dominoes and then knocks over this other thing. And then there are all these physical processes. And if it goes well, everything is completely determined. There is no spontaneity. There's no free will at any given point in the interaction uh, that, that uh, emerges. And they're fascinating for a lot of reasons, but uh, suppose life was like that. Suppose the world was like that. And you're saying, you know, suppose the materialist, the reductive materialist is right. That like, you know, the ball just happens to kind of roll, the neuron rolls in a certain way. And all of our subjective experiences can be explained in the same way our physical behaviors might be able to be explained in terms of the brain or whatever. For you, that world just turns gray and all of the color, all the beauty, all the value, just everything drains out of it. And I want to kind of push on that a bit. Uh, why? why? Why is it so bad if there isn't this subjectivity? And is it just the consciousness or is it something more like this freedom or free will or, you know, the kinds of things that we think maybe come with that uh, reflective awareness, whatever it is. So that's the question. Why? Why is that so bad? Why is it so bad if everything's just a big Rube Goldberg machine? Well, good. So I would want to sharply distinguish the issue of consciousness from the issue of freedom. So mm -hmm. it, it, it seems perfectly possible in principle to have a world where there are conscious subjects, subjects with, with experiences, they, they experience the world, maybe they have pleasure and pain, um, and maybe some of these experiences are valuable, they maybe have intrinsic value and disvalue, the, but it's completely devoid of any freedom. So maybe mm -hmm. um, everything they do is physically determined or determined by the laws of nature um, such that once you fix the initial conditions of the universe, there's one and only one future compatible with the laws of nature and the initial conditions of the universe. That seems to be a coherent scenario. Um, it seems to be a scenario in which there is some value, the value associated with positive subjective experiences. Maybe there's even a great deal of value, though I think in that scenario, mm -hmm. we're still missing out on one significant kind of value, the, the kind of value that, that comes from genuinely free agency. Okay, um, so, so wait, let me describe this back to you. So worst case scenario in Brian's book, the world is a Rube Goldberg machine that is unobserved by anyone and that is like uninternalizable. It's just like things bouncing into each other. Maybe there's animals, but they're dumb and they have like these instincts that just move them around and whatever. There's no even subjective awareness, et cetera. That's the worst. They're like animatronic robots. <laughs> yeah, it's like Disney World or something. I've never been. Yeah. I'm still sad of it. Anyway, so gray world. That is like a gray warehouse with the lights off and we yeah. hate that place. Uh, here's another warehouse that we could go into. It's one in which, uh, it's, it's just the entire warehouse is full of a roller coaster, right? And it's the same animatronic things, but the lights are on and there's us in the roller coaster. Can't do anything. We're just sitting there and we get to observe it all, but everything is predetermined. We're all just like going around in this thing. And you think like, well, there more value if you consider the warehouse as a whole than the animatronics in the dark but still not as much value as other warehouses. Is, is the third big category just the freedom and agency warehouse? Is that where we're at next? Or do you think there's other ones between? That, that seems like the natural next step in the progression, but maybe mm -hmm. it's not even a warehouse. We break down the walls, we roam <laughs> free. It's Westworld, spoiler alert. Oh, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> so this is not a, you know, the, I guess the, there's more to be said than this, but you know, we, we ordinarily think, I mean, of course there's, there's debates among philosophers as, as to whether we really have the kind of robust free will or free agency that, that we often think we do. But even if you think we do, as, as I do, have a very robust kind of free will, um, it's, it's generally gonna be thought that non-human animals, they have subjective experiences, but they don't have a really robust form of free agency. They don't have the mm -hmm. kind of free agency that would ground moral responsibility, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but we ordinarily think that animals' lives can have some value, maybe not as much as the lives of 
you know, of, of, of human beings. But we think that, you know, a dog can have a perfectly good life in virtue of having all sorts of pleasant experiences and running around in the park and eating really good dog food. And conversely, a dog can have a really bad life by being subjected to all sorts of pain and misery and suffering. Um, and both of those, the, the, the good dog life and the bad dog life, go well beyond what could happen in your first scenario where there's merely the kind of insentient animatronic complicated yeah. machines where you know maybe you have in that scenario a dog acting as though it's suffering but mm -hmm. by stipulation it doesn't actually suffer and it mm -hmm. seems like the, the the fact that it's not actually suffering means that there's not actually the real disvalue that comes from suffering or the dog that acts as though it's having a really good time at the park. If it's not actually experiencing any pleasant sensations, I would say there's there's no significant value to that scenario. Maybe maybe we would be fooled into thinking that it's having valuable states, but if, mm -hmm. if there's really no subjective experiences going on there, then it seems to be pretty significantly devoid of value. This gives like a whole nother like metaphysical layer to this phrase good dog you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah there you go. all right so let me ask you though and let's go all the way to the agency freedom free will etc uh i can totally i'm on board with exactly the distinctions that you're making here and i think the free the robust version of free will freedom agency etc not only do i think that's true but i think it's like obviously a world without is way better way more valuable than the other kinds of worlds we described and so my question for you though is what's the connection between free will agency etc on the one hand and then these other things that we've been talking about subjectivity consciousness do you think there are really tight conceptual connections here or do you think that they're kind of looser? Do you have a lot of views about the connections? Yeah, yeah. good. So there's there's going to be a lot of philosophical controversies here. I can I can tell you my views on some of the connections here. So okay. so so one issue is is there a connection between <clears throat> free will and subjective experience, consciousness? And another is is there a connection between free will and the issue of of materialism? And mm -hmm. those are closely closely related. So first of all, I would say that um, the, the connection between free will and, and consciousness is this. Consciousness does not entail free will, but free will does entail consciousness. The reason okay. consciousness does not entail free will is connected to my earlier point about the dog. The dog can have consciousness in the sense of mm -hmm. first person experience in the world, subjective experiences, all that, um, but w w without free will. The reason why I think on the other side, free will does entail consciousness is I think the notion of free will, at least insofar as I can understand it, involves at a minimum the capacity to consider, consciously consider different courses of action and maybe weigh the reasons supporting one against the reasons supporting another. And on the basis of those deliberations to make a choice to go down one path rather than another. And I can't make sense of that kind of deliberative process going on completely in the absence of consciousness. So it seems to me that that deliberative process essentially is going to involve certain subjective experiential states of consciously considering one option and the reasons that favor it, consciously considering another option and the reasons that favor that, and then making a conscious choice on the basis of those deliberations. I, I, I can't imagine a, mm. a so-called zombie or an animate or, you know, like a, a robot that's experientially all, all dark on the inside, undergoing anything that I would want to call like meaningfully free agency. It's so interesting because it raises for me this question of what sort of activity you're engaged in when you're say deliberating or choosing, et cetera. Um, and the way that it sort of struck me now that I have this background you gave us at the beginning of this conversation is as kind of a, a, a like a level of explanation or type of explanation question. It's like, what type of activity is deliberation? Well, it's something you do in the first person point of view. It's something you do as a conscious, you know, subject, uh, et cetera. And suddenly that just like, you know, just struck me as a, as a new explanatory category, one that we haven't like, you know, talked a lot about with even mental life. I mean, you know, set aside kind of the materialist stuff for a second and even think like, well, mental life, well, a lot of that can be psychological. A lot of that can be, you know, there's all kinds of ways we could describe 
human action. Here, as you were describing it, weighing reasons, making choices, deliberating, I'm reminded of this beautiful phrase, beautiful, I think it's beautiful, I think it's from McDowell, uh, of being in the space of reason. Uh, uh, just, it seems to me like it's just agency, space of reason. It's just a fundamental or a unique place to be. Mm -hmm. I, does that make any sense? I sound like I'm high on drugs. <laughs> no, I, 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 I think being in what McDowell called the, the space of reasons is a very distinctive mode of consciousness that's importantly different from say like merely having a sensation of like taste or smell or whatever yeah, yeah. um it's it, it's importantly different from from other forms of consciousness and yeah i mean it, it seems to be something worth, worth theorizing about it seems like we're, we're not, we're not going to have a a complete understanding of consciousness in general without understanding the the distinctive modes of consciousness that we're, we're capable of entering and the 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 mode of consciousness associated with conscious deliberation, appreciating reasons, and and acting on on the basis of those reasons, uh, yeah, yeah, it it, it it seems to be something worth thinking about and, and and something worth theorizing about. Yeah, cool. And let me say too, like as a side note, uh, I take the phrase from McDowell entirely poetically. I don't actually care at all what he's thinking about when he's talking about the space of reasons. Like, yeah, I mean, I do care. It's fine, but like. When I just hear that phrase, I just think of like the activity that you're sort of engaged in when you're expressing or exercising agency. And uh, I just take that as a poetic phrase and I just like have like, you know, uh, uh, run, run with it. Um, cool. OK, so OK, so now that we're in this in this sort of first personal po point of view, uh, one one question about value or meaning that I think we can bring up and meaning is something that we haven't even started talking about, but um, is just, okay, seems to me one of the reasons it's really important to get clear on the mind-brain relationship, maybe other relationships in that neighborhood, soul, mind, brain, soul, mind, brain, body, all that kind of stuff, is because uh, a lot of the, the ways that we describe action, our own or other people's action, uh, and a lot of the ways that we then, um, you know, evaluate action and determine whether somebody's responsible for something or not, whether we can blame them for something or not, et cetera. A lot of those things, they just presuppose a bunch of stuff about uh, agency, about freedom, about free will. Now, whether they do or not, and now we're getting into territory that I actually know a little bit better, but um, not better than you, Brian, though maybe I do, I don't know. We should have a contest. Uh, but anyway, th that I know that I know better than I know the other stuff. Um, you know, there's a lot of complications. You know, some people think, yes, the view that we have that if you're fully determined, you're not responsible, this kind of intuitive view, you know, like, yeah, that's true. That's not whatever. A lot of arguments here. We're going to gloss over a lot of these things. But what I want to ask you about is, you know, now that you've given us kind of a view about the relationship between consciousness and freedom, say, or I forget how exactly you put that, free will and consciousness. Uh, you know, do you see, so what are the connections that you see then between the philosophy of mind that you're doing, consciousness, subjectivity, and these really thick normative concepts, these concepts like responsibility, blame, even virtue, or, you know, descriptions of actions that would, you know, be virtuous or vicious, et cetera. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, do, you, yeah. do you have a lot of thoughts about stuff in that realm? Yeah, I mean, I certainly think that there are connections between the idea of moral responsibility, blame, and, and, and so forth, and these issues of materialism that we were discussing earlier. So Good. one reason why, you know, one, one, I think, important objection to materialism that is somewhat independent of the considerations about consciousness has to do with the connection between materialism and free will and the possibility of moral moral responsibility and the very existence of morality. So I'm so you know 
Historically, materialism has gone with the doctrine of determinism. So for listeners who might not know, determinism is typically defined by philosophers as, as the thesis that if you take the complete state of the world at any point in the past, together with the laws of nature, like the fundamental laws of physics, that determines a unique future. There's only one possible future compatible with the laws of nature, given the complete state of the world at, at, at some point in the past. And the I, world I, is I, a Rube Goldberg machine, is that it, fair? It, exactly, yeah. So a famous thought experiment here um, that's due to the, the French physicist and philosopher Pierre Simon Laplace is, you know, he, he imagined this like super intelligent demon where you, you tell the demon the, the exact position and momentum of every particle in the universe, like at the, at the beginning of the universe. And then you give him the laws of physics and he can just kind of churn out by calculation exactly what's going to happen. So he could predict that like Biden would win the 2020 election <laughs> and that this criminal would commit a crime at exactly this time and, and, and so forth. Um, so Traditionally or historically, materialism has gone with this doctrine of determinism. And I'm of the opinion that if determinism is true, there's not free agency and, and or at least there's not the kind of free agency that would be needed to ground ultimate re moral responsibility. And also I think if, if determinism is true, um, it's hard to make sense of the idea that like there are real moral truths, like it, it was like that it was wrong for so-and-so to commit murder. Why? Because we ordinarily think that ought implies can. So if we say that X ought not to have done that, that implies that it was within his power not to have done that. But if mm. determinism is true, I think there's a plausible case that it wasn't within his power not to do that. Mm. And so basically determinism would imply that you can never truly say that someone ought not to have done something, at least if you accept ought implies can, which seems pretty plausible. Um, and it also just seems to me for, for closely related reasons that no one is like ultimately morally responsible for what they do if determinism is true. Why? Because if determinism is true, then their actions were just a consequence of the laws of nature together with the initial conditions of the universe. And nobody's responsible for the laws of nature. Nobody's responsible for the initial conditions of the universe. And whatever is just like a logical consequence of things that you're not responsible for is also going to be something that you're not responsible for. So, so I'm convinced by these kind of standard arguments for for what's called incompatibilism, that if determinism is true, there, there's no free will, there's no moral responsibility. Um, on the other hand, I think it's very plausible that you know there are moral truths, certain things are wrong, we are morally responsible for, for, for certain of our behaviors. So I think that's a reason to reject determinism. And to the extent that there's an association between materialism and determinism, I think that that can be a reason also to reject materialism. Uh, one complication there is, um, you know, nowadays there's like quantum mechanics, which on some interpretations <laughs> are not fully deterministic. And so, you know, it, it's going to be possible in principle yeah. to be a materialist without being a determinist. But I think yeah. that the kind of indeterminism yeah. you get is also probably going to be incompatible with free will for, for somewhat more complicated reasons. So I think if you do think that we have free will and moral responsibility, I, I think that's going to push not just against determinism, but also mm. against materialism more broadly, even the indeterministic kinds of materialism. Yeah, interesting. Man, you just said so many smart brain things right there. And I think it, what, it, what, it, what it strikes me is, is yeah, it, it strikes me that we ought to do a whole episode on moral responsibility, um, partly because I'm just fascinated by that. That's the thing that I care most about um, in philosophy. And then from there to like, you know, uh, responsibility for your beliefs and, you know, that kind of stuff. But, <laughs> but I want to thank you right now for joining me, Brian. Uh, you're a smart dude and a, and a good neighbor. And uh, I really Shoot. appreciate your taking the time. And um, yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for, for talking about all this stuff. Uh, yeah. It's been fun. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. All right. We'll see Have you, Brian. We'll see you at home. <laughs> all right. Bye.